Particular 12, I mean, uh, well, in the, in the context of the comparison between on the motivic cohomology and K theory on the other. You will see that the torsion is not the same on both sides, and the 12 seems to have something to do with K theory and not motivic cohomology. Anyway, so let me, so now I'm going to talk about something that will seem totally different. So, uh, <laughs> I will, I just want to remind you of the Grothendieck Riemann Roch theorem, because this is what this is really about. So. so the Grothendieck Riemann Roch theorem is quite a it's quite a famous theorem. But uh, on the other hand, it's, it's famous and infamous at the same time. That is, uh, many people don't, you know, are not familiar with the statement. So I'm, I'm going to so give one special case. So if you look at, um, it's, it's, a geometric, it's a very general geometric statement. Right? So if you take a morphism of schemes, okay, yeah. so projective and let's say smooth, and you, you make hypotheses uh, on X and S, you know, regular, Noetherian separated. Uh, well then, and if you consider E on X a vector model, formula for the Chang character of the relative uh, Euler characteristic. I'm going to explain what this is.
So, uh, so this is um, a formula for the relative Euler characteristic with vector bundle in the family. So in fact, to understand this family is this, this um, statement, if you are not familiar with this kind of thing. First think of simply S as a point, huh? spectrum of the field. In this case, the trend character is simply the rank. So this is simply the regular Euler characteristic. So that there's no and so what this says is that the Euler characteristic of E, that is the alternating sum of the dimensions of the holomorphic cohomology groups, so I mean the uh, coherent cohomology groups, can be computed as a direct image at the level of cohomology. And here you have to therefore you have to compute the integral of a certain linear combination of trend classes, and, and there comes in also the certain trend classes of the tangent bundle, which of course might seem rather mysterious. What does the tangent bundle have to do with this? This is a deep statement. So you have, so here come certain trend classes of tangent bundles, specifically the top class, and then other uh, trend classes of the vector bundle itself. So, uh, yeah, so in the case where S is a point, this, so this is then usually called the Hilzebrock Riemann formula. And if you specialize this to a point of a curve, you get the Riemann Roth formula that's um, of a curve, you know, which is the most, probably the most famous form. And in fact, in that case, you see already on the curve, you can see that something like this must happen, must um, come in. Because on, on the curve, you have degree of d plus 1 minus g. Uh, and 1 minus g is uh, the degree of the canonical bundle. And you see, this is already this is visible. Anyway, so this is a very, um, uh, this is a uh, theorem in relative form. And here you have to take the fiber integral. You can work in the cohomology theory. I mean, here I've written somehow the universal cohomology theory, which is the intersection ring. <coughs> And in this case, what you get here is a linear combination of coherent sheaves on S. But for these, you, you can make sense of a churn character. And then it computes this churn character. So it's a very general relative formula. Uh, so this is the growth of the agreement of formula. Uh, and yeah, one important thing is that the yeah, the Todd class, uh, in fact, it's silly, I should have written down the exact formula. I don't know, I don't know the exact formula off the top of my head. But the, so the Todd class is a, is a linear combination of uh, certain functions in the trend classes of TF, but in that linear combination, you have the new numbers. So this is the link with what I said before. Huh? So this is where it where they are working. So. Now, what I, now, what I would like to do, in fact, I'm going to look at four different forms of this theorem. So first, I'm, I'm going to look at a certain uh, object, uh, and I'm going to apply the Golden agreement rock theorem to it. So here's the object point can list. Um, so application so I'm going to look at an abelian scheme. An oh, no, abelian scheme is a family of abelian varieties. So for instance an elliptic scheme, so a family of elliptic curves. And this can be also when you mean scheme that this could be for instance over the spectrum of the ring of a ring of integers. So then the Generic point is an elliptic curve defined over some longer field, and then you have uh, one fiber for every prime p. So, in a general setting, here we have this and the Gabinian scheme. And uh, I want to apply it to a certain vector bundle, so what I do is I choose a, a line bundle, L. And I suppose that it is a torsion line bundle. So we have L tensor N is isomorphic to the structure sheet of A. And I also suppose that L is non-trivial on 
among the fibers of A. What I mean by that is that if you restrict L to any fiber of A over S, you get another torsion line model, but I don't want this torsion line model to be the trivial one. I want it to be the non-trivial torsion model. That means not that it shouldn't have any section. And, um, okay, so I'm, uh, this is a very general situation. You want this, the line model corresponds to a section of the dual median scheme. And it, uh, the condition is that this section should be not the zero section and that it should never meet the zero section on any fiber. Now, I apply the Grothendieck-Riemann-Roch theorem to this. So, I mean, the idea is it is shaped. So am I going to obtain something interesting? So here's the question. So I look at, well, for one thing, so, so apply, yeah. apply GR to L. Well, then you get, OK, so look at this formula. So I'm applying this formula here. So now it is a fact that a torsion line model of this kind has no cohomology whatsoever. It has no zero section, no sections, and it has no higher cohomology. Okay. That means that in, on this side, you get zero. You get simply zero. <coughs> now, if you look at the other side, so you get zero. So on the other side, well, so in the median scheme, if you have Td of T pi. Well, as it happens, because it is a, a, a group scheme, the relative tangent bundle is trivial on the fibers. Huh? So it comes from the tangent bundle on the base. And then you can apply, you know, there's a projection formula, so it means partial multiplication. So you can write this as simply told of the restriction of the tangent bundle to the zero section. So this is now something that lives on the base, on S, and the tot, and then I can multiply it by this. Okay. Okay, but now this is a calculation in, in the Chow ring. If L is a torsion bundle, actually the trend character is simply one, because we've tensed with Q. We've tensed with Q. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they are, since you've killed all denominators, this is simply equal to one. Okay, but now if you integrate one, there's a shift in degree, so you get zero again. Okay. So because the integral of one has to, will go down, and this is a graded ring, like any cohomology ring, and you go down in the degree, and since you've started in degree zero, you're going to get zero again. So I get zero equals zero, and uh, that's certainly true, but it's not interesting. Uh, doesn't seem very sort of uh, very fruitful. Now, uh, so okay, so that this might be the end of the class. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, now I want to apply a slightly refined theorem to uh, this situation again. Hmm? So, uh, and this is where Arakilov theory comes in. So if you have, um, um, so, okay, so now this, I face the problem that I have every time I try to talk about Arakilov theory in, uh, in, in, in talks, which is that there's a whole language and of course a whole point of view, and it's impossible to simply, you know, throw all that up. You know, the audience in just a few minutes. Uh, so, but okay, I will nevertheless make this sort of half-hearted attempt to <laughs> convey some ideas. So, the, so in so in Arakilo theory, uh, if you so the basic idea is that you so in practice you look at arithmetic schemes, so in an arithmetic situation, and then you but what but you do what you do is that you also endow all the objects and sites with supplementary analytic data. So typically, for instance, and this was the setting of Arakilov at the beginning, you would have 
an arithmetic surface, so uh, the scheme of uh, dimension 2 of uh, the, uh, the, ring, the ring of integers of a number field. And then it has a generic fiber, and then you can, of course, uh, base change to the complex numbers, and you get a Riemann surface. And this Riemann surface you endow with various analytic data, you know, uh, kilometric, typically the array kilometric, which is canonical. And then you try to look at all the classical objects of algebraic geometry, like the visors, vector bundles, and every time, analytic data. So for instance, a vector bundle will then on the complex numbers be endowed with a Venetian metric. A divisor will be endowed with certain specific currents, called green currents, that you have to add to the data. And then, once you've done that, then you try to develop the whole theory, I mean, uh, you know, uh, carrying along uh, the, all these uh, data as well. And uh, if you want the, fundamentally, the motivation behind, behind this, and why you want to do this, is because there's this hope, for instance, this can also be seen uh, in the case of uh, arithmetic surfaces, you see, if you try to define an, uh, an intersection number between, suppose you look at an arithmetic surface and you want to define the arithmetic, the arithmetic intersection number between two cycles. Well, this is actually problematic because what you can do is if you look at, so you have an arithmetic surface, it's fibered, you know, for each prime number, you've got a, a fiber. But if you take two cycles, well, if they're both vertical, that means both you know, in, in a fiber, then it's no problem. You can also intersect the vertical one with the horizontal one. But you cannot intersect two horizontal cycles. Problem is that is you can intersect them, of course, but this will not be a deformation invariant. And that this is fundamentally due to the fact that you're not in a compact situation on the base. You, know, you need to. But on the other hand, if you throw in all these analytic data, you can produce a well-defined arithmetic intersection number. Uh, so that's the motivation, to sort of replicate the situation that you would be in if you had a surface over a compact Riemann surface. So um, anyway, so Arakilo theory, so you know, there was a big development in the 80s, and a big general theory was developed, and in particular, you have an analog of this theorem here. And uh, so traditionally in Arakilo theory, most counterparts of classical objects come with a little hat. So in fact, uh, this is what it all amounts to. You have the Grothendieck Grumman Roth theorem and with a hat. And uh, so this is the following statement. So I mean, just take exactly the same situation, but in this case, you have to make some hypotheses that make sense for Arikilo theory. So S, everything has to be arithmetic. So it has to be over the ring of integers of the number field, and you have to be able to base change to C. So, but anyway, I'm not going to introduce all this terminology. I'm just going to... So you, but basically, <coughs> the statement is something like this. You have a hat, of course, and, and then you take... Uh, and here you put a bar. The bar, it means that E is endowed with the emission metric. And then you lift, then you work in uh, an, a compactified, that is a, an Arakilov intersection ring, and you have all these objects with hats. Yeah, and uh, you have to remove from this uh, something very mysterious called the Argens. understand this formula, uh, you think you have to imagine the following. So here you take, you have your vector bundle E, 
In fact, to make sense of this expression, you have to make a regularity hypothesis, which is that these relative cohomology sheaves should not be simply coherent, but really locally free. Okay, so they just suppose that. So you suppose that they're locally free. You have a Hermitian metric on E. And then you can, in fact, endow these also with Hermitian metrics simply by averaging the Hermitian metric on the fibers. And here, uh, well, there's a notion of arithmetic churn classes, that is, Arakilov churn classes of every type, the Hermitian bundles. And you land in the arithmetic intersection ring, CH hat, huh? defined in general by Gia and Sule. And, um, and it has a functoriality for smooth projective push forward, which is reflected here. Forget this term here for the moment, which is a bit mysterious, which is actually not going to concern us very much. Uh, yeah, and so the main insight of the arithmetic Riemann Roth theorem, the, the Grothendieck the Riemann Roth theorem, is that in fact, in order to make sense of such an equality, you have to throw in here the purely analytic datum, which is called, which is the analytic torsion. And this is also a kind of by a kind of historical twist. It is rather surprising that the analytic torsion should come in here because it, that, that was defined by Ray and Singer much earlier, in the, in the end of the 60s. And uh, and it is a what it is in fact it is a purely analytic invariant, which you obtain by constructing a zeta function from the eigenvalues of the Kodaira Laplacian, and then. Uh, looking at the analytic continuation and then evaluating it at zero. Hmm? That's the derivative of theory. Tau of e. So what do you mean by that? So what does it mean to throw in the analytic torsion? Ah, well, since, you know, as I, as I explained, all the, the Arakilov um, uh, rings come with analytic data. Mm -hmm. And in fact, yes, so this is very this. Let me just give one property which which explains how this can come out this. Which is that you so you have a fundamental exact sequence which is following. Since this ring, so, so we've thrown more data into it. Of course, we can decide to forget the data. So forgetting the data gives you ring morphism from this one into the traditional channel. And the kernel is a certain something, which of course must be purely analytic, and, and it is. So it is a space of differential forms of certain type. In fact, this is a, these are all differential forms of type PP, and you need, then you mod out by the image of M delta and M delta bar. It's also called Epley cohomology, for those who know what that is, or part of, yeah. And the, and the kernel of this map here is, interestingly, uh, it is the image of the, these motivic cohomology groups, the, of two, type 2p minus 1p, into this here. So this would be, in fact, I'm going to call it SIC, so this, or realization map. You want. Some people would call that a regulator, but I prefer to apply regulator to the map from K theory. So if you really look at motivic cohomology, I think we shouldn't talk about the regulator, we should talk about realization or cycle maps. Because this is really the pendant of Chow theory. So when you go from Chow theory to cohomology theory, you don't talk about the regulator. Uh, yeah, and in fact, the image here uh, factors through. The uh, analytic Deleen cohomology. So I have so in fact, this space here contains analytic Deleen cohomology. What I mean by analytic Deleen cohomology, I simply mean Deleen cohomology. But 
these days, there are no logarithmic singularities, for example. In fact, this was this be the original definition. <coughs> so ignoring possible singularities of the boundary. And uh, so there's a, there's a realization map, and it factors through this. Okay. And the analytic torsion lives in here. Okay, so it is a differential, so in degree zero it is a function, but in fact, in general, in the form I've written it here, it is a differential form that lives in here. Sorry, just, uh, so then the, the dash is a minus, right? The dash, the dash. just the different side. Just ah, yes, 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 this is a minus, yes, because I forgot to write it. This is a minus. <laughs> yes, I forgot to write it. So, thank you for the line of this. So, this here minus this is equal to this minus this. Okay, but forget that. Okay, so it is. Um, uh, so in a it, so in a way, the fundamental insight is that you will have a formula of the same shape, but there's a deep analytical uh, spectral datum that you have to throw in to make this true. Um, and in fact, if you, look at, if you look at only the degree one part of this formula, only degree one, so in fact, then you get the first trend class, and then you get, uh, well, the Hermitian line bundle. And the thing is, when you remove this, this corresponds to not, put, not putting simply the average metric on the, this line bundle, but to put the Quillen metric. So the Quillen metric is a, well, it's quite a famous metric that basically comes from throwing in the analytic torsion. Somehow it's Quillen who saw this in the 80s. So anyway, th this, this uh, theorem is the result of the work of many people, uh, beginning with Foltings and then Gier and Soule, and the main analytic input, and probably the biggest component of the theorem, is this group. And um, so it's many people here. Well, and no, now, of course, what, once you you have a big uh, uh, statement like this, then you might try again to look at a very simple situation like this one. So, okay, so now I'm going to I have this theorem, and I want to apply it to this geometric situation. So what am I going to obtain? Uh, so in fact, you don't need to know to know much about the Euler theory because there's so much vanishing going on anyway that you know, not much is going to happen. So if you look at this side, well then, okay, you now apply uh, to uh, so L on. A over S. Now, okay, in order to make sense of this, you first have to put a mission metric on the line bundle L. As it happens, on abelian schemes, with this kind of situation, there is a very canonical way to do this. So in fact, if you Take the line bundle and you suppose as well that it is rigid, that means trivial, canonically trivial at the origin, and restricted to the zero section, then there is a way to put the uh, emission metric on, on L in a canonical fashion, uh, and which is in fact the one that's compatible with the theorem of the cube, uh, for those who know what that is. And so I, I simply I take this metric and, uh, and also I have to choose uh, a Hermitian metric on the relative tangent bundle, and this again can be done in a very canonical fashion by choosing a relatively ample bundle, and then in fact uh, you take its first, uh, it, it is endowed then with a certain canonical metric, and uh, there is a, this leads to a relative Riemann form, uh, and this relative Riemann form gives you again a very natural choice of Hermitian metric on the relative tangent bundle. So, so when you've done, so, so there are very canonical choices for all the emission metrics at play. Now, if I apply this, so what do I take? Well, of course, this here will again be zero because there is no cohomology. So, will vanish. 
And if you look at this computation here, well, if you look at the computation I did before, well, the same thing applies, because the, I have chosen a metric in such a way that it is compatible with the trivialization on the fibers as, as it happens. Therefore, you can make the same calculation with the projection formula. And it is also true that ch hat of L is equal to 1. So in fact, this is again 0. Uh, and this here is, OK, this I didn't talk much about this. But this uh, also vanishes in our situation for, for similar reasons. So in fact, you get 0. It's not very encouraging. But as it happens, you see there's just one thing that apparently is not zero, which is this. Okay, so <coughs> this is zero, this is zero, everything's zero, but the analytic torsion form. So you get uh, zero minus okay, equals zero minus zero. So so uh, again, one might not think that this is there's much to this, but as it happens, the, this vanishing is a very deep fact because you uh, uh, what does it say exactly? So you have this uh, this analytic invariant, and the statement is that it is, it is zero, but not in here. The statement that it vanishes in here, of course, we work in the arithmetic chariot. So it says that if you take the image of this in here, it will be zero. But since you have this exact sequence, that means that this here lies in the image of the realization map. So, or in other words, I mean, so if I look at this in a, in a very simple setting, if you look at the setting of elliptic schemes, of an elliptic, uh, an elliptic curve, and you look at only the degree one part of the statement, so you look at one here, and then in fact you get a function here, so it's not just a reference point, you get a function. Here you have CH1, which is like, a, you know, like the Picard group, Arakilov Picard group, here you have the Picard group, and here you've got uh, the units. So let me just. to look only at the degree one part in the arithmetic chariot. <coughs> um, so then you so then in fact you obtain the following sequence. So you have O of S Q goes into well okay, sum of Here, when should really put um, yeah, how am I going to write this? 
so it's just C infinity of S of C. Since I don't want to introduce lots of notation, I'm just going to. Yeah, and here, in fact, you've got minus log. So here I have, I have written more concretely this sequence in the further degree one part. And in that case, you get functions as instead of differential forms. Okay, then you get these two groups. In the kernel, you get the corresponding graded element, and that, as it happens, is the units. It's the units of S tensed with Q. And here you've got the very usual minus log function, the Dirichlet regulator. This can be specialized to number field, and you get the Dirichlet regulator. Here you get a sum of copies of R over all the embeddings of uh, the base number field into C. And so here you get the classical Dirichlet regulator. Well, and here you get the compact, uh, this group, which in that case is very much like the ideal path. Uh, now, so the statement in this case, so supp suppose you apply it to this situation. Huh? Then the statement is the functional part of the analytic torsion is, in fact, the logarithm of the unit. And in fact, the analytic curve, you can make this very explicit because the analytic, analytic torsion of a torsion model can be computed uh, as an Eisenstein series. And here the statement is, this Eisenstein series is minus the logarithm of something. And this, as it happens, I mean, that is something that is also predicted by second, uh, Kronecker's second limit formula. So the Kronecker's second limit formula is precisely something like that. But a certain Eisenstein series, uh, well, that in fact, that it, what happens is that a certain Eisenstein series has a pole at one, and uh, the residue is pi at something. And then the second term in the Laurent development is minus the logarithm of the unit. And so this is, this is what's contained in this statement here. Of course, the dis I mean, this is weaker than the second chronicle in the formula because it doesn't actually give you a formula for the unit, but you know that there is one for this. Yeah, and of course, this formula is more general, and in, in that case, you get that the whole torsion form is in the image of the regulator, and this can be understood in terms of pole logarithms. That is, this is a, that is or log rather <coughs> pole zero. That is. This is the zero part of, a, of, a, of, a, of the polylogarithm, and it is the realization of a certain element in this cohomology group. So, uh, so in this sense, that can be understood in a general form as a kind of generalization to the polylogarithmic side of something of the second chronic limit formula. What do you mean with the zero part of the polylogarithm? Well, the pol. Um, so how does it look? The uh, the yeah. So the polylogarithm, when uh, special uh, specialized to zero section to to uh, torsion sections of well of the dual abelian scheme, will give you elements in this group. And the point is that this here is the realization of that element. So it's a, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. So when, when you point at this group, you're pointing up high, so where it's landing on your finger. What I'm saying is that if you specialty, that a certain speci uh, specialization of the polylogarithm <coughs> to torsion sections give you elements in this group. Okay, it gives you more, it gives you more, because the polylogarithm in general gives you lots of elements in here. But in particular, you can use it to construct elements in here, the, the pole zero. And, uh, and that gives, in fact, well, elliptic units, for instance. And uh, in that case, it replicates this situation. But in general, uh, the realization will be uh, this, this here. The, the fact that it is that is not obvious. I mean, this has to be proved. You know, this is proven in an article by Dieter Kings myself. But, but, you, but this is the connection. Uh, yeah, and now in fact the, the 
real point of these lectures is not even to, uh, it's not even that really, um, this lecture. But it is, um, well, just to come back to the torsion situation, remember that the original concern was the 12 that appeared in uh, the, uh, the, the formula for the Dedekind zeta function. Uh, so there's this 12. And so in this situation, it comes down to the following. So we have here we have this formula. So we know that the, the torsion, analytic torsion form is in the image of the cycle map. Let me always say cycle map rather than realization. So a cycle map. But all this is of course tensor Q. We've worked here with a growth degree graph. There are rational coefficients in the trend classes. So you've got tensor Q. So you don't have any information on the torsion. What I mean with information on the torsion is that I have this element t, t of l, and I would like to know which multiple of t is in the image of the integral motivic common key. Not just q, but really integral. So in the case, for instance, in this situation, this is a very concrete problem. I have my, uh, my function here, over the number field, I have to be my elements, my real, my real numbers. And I want to know which um, multiple of this real number is really in the lattice, the Dirichlet lattice. Yeah. Which one? So the answer of Kubert and Lang in this situation is that in that case it's 12. Well, well that is, it's not, it's 12 times n, where n is the, the order of that. Um, yeah, and this is, this is the, uh, the calculation I would like to replicate. That is, I would like to know what the order of t of l bar is. Now, this, is, this might seem like quite a challenge, because how are you going to control the nonlinearities in the formula? But this is where uh, my work, uh, my, my PhD thesis comes in handy. Uh, my PhD thesis is from eons ago. So, uh, and this is, um, this is, uh, if you want, it, it deals precisely with this problem. So now, in order to explain how one can deal with this problem, of course, you first have to explain how you can deal with that problem without a hat, because after all, it's the same issue. How do you control denominators in the growth of the agreement of So this is something that, um, uh, this is something that was addressed in the 60s already in SGA6, you know, when the growth of the agreement of theorem was proven. I said nothing about the history of this, but this is, of course, a, a big product of the, the without hat theorem of the Groton Deep School. And they already addressed this problem, and this led to a theorem which uh, gives a lot more information about the torsion. And this is called the adams riemann theorem. So let me just formulate this. Um, So now forget the hats again and come back to an unhatted world. So you have um, so torsion. So Adams Riemann world. Um, so this is a theorem that was not applied many times. In fact, I don't really know many applications at all. And in fact, it seems that it seems to me. <laughs> that the only application of this theorem is with the hat in this situation, and I don't know any other one. So sorry. I mean, sorry, Adams yeah. stands for Frank Adams? Sorry? Is it for Frank Adams? The topologist? Uh, the topologist, yes. But uh, that is, that's not because he actually had anything to do with this theorem. It's because um, the, the so-called Adams operations appear in the most Yeah, so... Okay, the adams riemann rach theorem is, so again, you consider the same situation. Huh? So F, X, S, huh? usual conditions. Okay, so projective smooth, then you take uh, reasonably regular schemes. And then the statement is, well, what you do is that you replace the term character by a more exotic operation. Huh? So you see, the term character goes from in fact, the growth in the group of vector bundles to the, uh, the, the intersection ring CH. Now, you can, you can look at something more elementary, but maybe less obvious, which is simply a, 
an endomorphism of uh, the Grothen E group itself. So, okay, I'm going to write this down. So you get the statement. Psi k of B. And then you And the relative Euler characteristic factors through the group. Huh? So it gives you, it gives you therefore, uh, quite, quite naturally, something that is written in this form, which goes from k0 of x to k0 of s. And here we have a, a theorem, which in fact is very similar to, in formally, to the Grothen E. Grumman Roth theorem, in the sense that. We want to. Uh, sorry, actually, I have to. This is the wrong word. I K of. So we we're, we're concerned with. We take the relative Euler characteristic. That's the direct image. And then we don't apply the train character, but we apply this exotic operation that I'm going to define in a moment. And here again, we take a direct image again, and we have to correct by a certain multiplicative term. That is the pendant of the, the top class. Now, what are all these terms? So the Adams operation, that is in fact, a, it's, it's an, a, simply an endomorphism of the Grothen D group itself. Uh, so it's a ring endomorphism of the Grothen D group itself, which is compatible with pullbacks. So and it has the basic property that if you apply it to a line bundle, then it simply it takes the line bundle and puts it to the power of tensor k. And uh, so k is fixed here. Huh? There's one theorem for every k. So there's a so you can take any k you choose. What is theta? Sorry? What is theta? Yeah, and theta is, um, so theta is a multiplicative class, just in fact like the top class for those who know that. And it is has the property that theta kl is 1 plus l plus l tends to, etc. plus l tensor k minus 1. So in fact, so this is additive and multiplicative, and multiplicative, and this is only multiplicative. What I mean with that is that if you take a direct sum here, it will transform the direct sum into a multiplication. Uh, yes. No, actually, this so this is badly expressed. This is simply uh, so ring and the morphism. So it will transform a direct sum into a multiplication. And on the line bundle, when you apply it to line bundle, it, it will compute 1 plus L plus L tensor 2 plus up to L tensor K minus 1. Okay. And in the case of the Adams operation, it does this. And this is compatible, but this will transform it an addition into an addition and a multiplication into a multiplication. So K to K, you have no compatibility with multiplication or type of the tensor product. And it is a theorem that this element, 
in fact, when you, when you apply theta k to any vector bundle, you can invert it with the Gaussian group. It has an inverse, provided you uh, localize at k. Localize at k. That's all you have to do. So the final statement is you can compute, you have a compatibility between Adams operations and direct images, but it, it comes with the compatibility is not. Uh, it doesn't simply commute, but it commutes provided you multiply here the Adams operation applied to E by this, uh, this term here, which is the inverse of this class theta k applied to the cotangent bundle of, of f. So omega f wants t f u. So it is completely formally uh, comparable to this, but in this case we don't leave K theory. Everything happens at the level of the Grothendi group. That's why you have the direct image here appears twice, you know, whereas here the integral is the direct image for the intersection. Now the advantage of this theorem is that you, okay, it is entirely in K theory, but you don't uh, lose all information on board. And you can vary k. So if you want another kind of information, you take a, another k, and you you can look at, in fact, all the you get information about the entire Gordon group. May, may I ask a question? Yeah. So if I read SJ six on, on this stuff, and then particularly the expose by Bertolo on lambda rings, will I recognize theta there under the name theta, or is it one of the other operations, lambda or, or gamma? Uh, no, no, that would be theta. Would be that, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. If I look back at that Lowe's expose, then yes, yeah, yeah. That, that is a very standard location yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, historically, the, in SGA 6, they had a problem because they were, in fact, not able to prove this with 1 on K. They had to tensor with Q. They had a problem. But this was then solved by Jo and Lou, who, who, who gave a proof uh, with 1 on K, and then, in fact, later worked by Fulton, McPherson, etc. I mean, provided a more streamlined approach where there's the problem disappears. So you only have 1 on K. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so this is the theorem. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, yeah. In SGA 6, in fact, it is used as a kind of intermediate. So this is a general theorem, and then from that theorem, you can prove this theorem here. No? So in fact, you can go back to the theorem for the intersection ring. But anyway, this is not our concern here. My concern here is to apply the theorem directly. OK, so take this theorem and apply, apply it with our torsion line bond. So what do you get? Well, 0 on this side, clearly, because it's again 0. And on this side, well, here again, this theorem, this term here, when you look at an abelian scheme, will split off because it comes from the base, as I explained before. You can multiply it out. Therefore, you've got here the direct image of this, which is again torsion, which again vanishes, so you get 0 equals 0. So it's again quite sort of discouraging. But now there is, and this is the what I did in my thesis, in fact, was uh, you, you have an Arakilov version of this uh, statement. Now, I'm not going to, I don't have the time to write down the, the analog again in all of this. But, of course, what you will obtain, again, looks very much the same. The only thing is that, so what will happen is, as we've seen here, when you take direct images, you have to throw in the analytic torsion. So the same thing, thing will happen here. You will have to throw in the analytic torsion here, and you will also have to throw it in here on both sides. And this R genus, this uh, strange term there, will also appear. But again, here, it's for our purposes, it will play no role. So in fact, what will happen is if you apply the hat version of this theorem, that you will get an identity that involves torsion on both sides, but all the geometric terms disappear, simply because there's no homology. And, uh, and, and so, you get, you, so you get a very precise uh, identity. And in fact, since I have little time, I'm going to write, tell you right away what, what the arithmetic identity, 
relations are that you get in the end. So, so now apply. Uh, so, Arith, uh, so Adam Sriman Roth with the hat huh? to to find AS and L. What thing? Yeah, so you get the following very simple thing. Um, uh, so here it is. Okay, so if you write dim uh, as equal g, okay, if you write that g, well then you have the following. You have that. Uh, for all k and l uh, in z, such that k minus, uh, well, k equal l mod n, where n is the order of the torsion. Hmm? So it is. you have k to the power 2g minus l to the power 2g times the torsion is equal to 0 in a k0 hat of the base. And then you, of course, have to localize at k and l. Okay, so this, this is what you obtain from this refined state. The analytic torsion for any... So, in fact, what I've done here is I have applied the adam sriemann roch theorem for K and for L. See? For K and for L. You can do it for, for both. And I suppose that they are both equal mod N. Well, then, if you, if you do this, you get this relation. K to the power G minus L to the power 2G times this. Uh, is equal to zero in this locali partially localized group. So again, you might think that this is, you don't get much out of this, but after that happens, this is not true. So, you, so here's a lemma. Um, I'm almost done. So, so the G being a Bean group. And take the uh, let alpha and g and n larger or equal to one, and also c is larger or equal to one. But now suppose that k to the power c minus l to the power c times alpha <coughs> is equal to zero and g localized. for all L and K such that L equals K mod N. So this is exactly the situation we're in here. Right? Then, in fact, the order of alpha divides 2 times N times <coughs> C times P doesn't divide n and p minus one divides c, p prime times p. 
So then you have this one. Okay, then the order of alpha divides this product of primes where p doesn't divide in, p minus 1 divides c. So in our case, c is equal to 2g. <coughs> and uh, yeah, and so for those who are uh, sort of arithmetically minded, <coughs> this will seem familiar. No? Uh, because this is a formula for the denominator, or this is a related to formula for the denominator of the Bernoulli number. So in fact, um, but the, the theorem of van Clausen uh, uh, says that. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm running out of time. But the, the theorem of van Clausen basically tells you that the denominator of uh, Bernoulli numbers have this kind of shape, and so you can apply that theorem, and then you know that the order of alpha is going to divide the denominator of the Bernoulli number. Now, if you go back to the elliptic situation, you get the 12 <coughs> that appears uh, in the classical statement. Although, quite irritatingly, you actually don't get 12, you get 24. There's a factor 2 that seems to be that you can't remove, so you don't get quite a, a result that's quite as good. But what's interesting is that then uh, this is a much more general result, and, got, and it gives you somehow uh, an, yeah, information on the torsion of the zeros polylogarithm. But again, this is the order, this, so this is the final remark I want to make. This is information about the order of the torsion when you look at the image of the regulator, but there's something that comes from K1, not something that comes from motivic homology. So it gives you information on torsion with respect to the regulator coming from K1. If this is, and this is quite important because this is not visible at the level of functions. Because at the level of functions, you see the first motivic cohomology group and K1, if you want, of a Dedekin ring, are the same. They're simply the, the, the units. But when you have a larger dimensional base, the torsion of the motivic cohomology and K theory are not the same. In fact, they're related by this very complicated spectral sequence. And these interesting arithmetic uh, torsion uh, has something to do with the torsion in, in K theory, not in motivic cohomology. So, uh, yeah, so this is simply a kind of uh, lesson of this, of this method of proof. So, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Questions? So, this K1 you mentioned at the end, was it standing on the board? The place of the word yes, no, exactly. lemma. It, yes, no, it's, it's a lack of time. It's because. Is that like some of the motivic cohomology groups that actually yeah, was it, 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 this, this is a very good point. You see, here you have the. Well, I've, I've erased the general sequence already, but this is the degree yeah, one part. Yeah. But this is the degree one part for the child theory. Of course, you must have a similar sequence for the Gordon group with that. This you do. But on this side, you don't get motivic cohomology, you get K theory, in fact, K1. K1, yeah. And of course, when you tensor with Q, you can identify these two. But the thing is, if you want torsion, then you're interested. It's only about the torsion of K1, not the torsion of motivic cohomology. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And somehow, uh, it seems that, yeah. In fact, it would be very interesting to have some information about the torsion when you look not at the regulator, but at the realization map from the cohomology. But that's completely, probably, it has nothing to do with the Bernoulli numbers. The Bernoulli numbers come from here. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, if I understood correctly, as long as you're uh, working with rational coefficients and uh, this arithmetic uh, Riemann Roth theorem, you, you basically reproduce a theorem of the Bido kings. Um, you, you mean the fact that um, this, uh, that this T tau thing comes from? Uh, well, not, well, not exactly, because what, what he says is, so he has the Hodge realization. If you want to, uh, so how can you? No, so what, what Wheeler Kings does in his article is that he will produce an element in K one, and now you can, and he, yeah, and then for. Uh, uh, 
in degree zero, that is in the functional case, he actually studies the Hodge realization, and they agree that it will correspond exactly to that, but that's the classical picture. On the other hand, he has no, uh, they have, I haven't seen a formula that computes the Hodge realization as being this analytic Torsen form. Uh, but of course, in theory, it's possible, because for instance, Levine uh, gave you know, explicit formulae for, 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 the, for the Fourier development of such things. And presumably, that would give you a formula that could be then evaluated to be the same as the analytic torsion form. But, but the thing is, this is, a, this is a difficult analytic thing, because when you look at the analytic torsion form, it's like you are on the side of Eisenstein series. You're not on the side of uh, uh, the, the pole. Uh, the, the link between the two is like the second chronicle limit formula. So, so you're facing a difficult analytic problem when you want to compare them. But if you want, yeah, all these objects are the same. In fact, you can prove that this is indeed uh, the, the, the pole. Well, you can show that. But, uh, so, so but it's not the case so that the, the only problem is that uh, the Pauli algorithm business doesn't work with integral coefficients. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, as I explained here, here the inter integrality is not on the side, it is not really on the side of, of, of the pole, it's on the side of the PDF. Yeah. Other questions?